Um, let's jump into our sermon together today. If you have a Bible, why don't you open to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to take a short break from Mark today because what a week it's been for our church. You know, it's just been crazy. I mean, I, it just made sense to me when I got a phone call from our alarm company at, at 5 a.m. this morning and they said the power was out. I'm like, of course it is. Like, it totally makes sense. Like, why wouldn't I expect something else to go strange around here? But if you were at Second Gathering last Sunday, at the end of Second Gathering, our, our latest staff member, our church planting lead and person on our lead team, Tom Regan, collapsed on the stage here during the last song and, uh, and hit the ground pretty hard, scared us all. Um, and we found out that he had a seizure. He was having a seizure here on the stage if you weren't here. We called the medics and cleared the, the chairs there and had the medics come in and they took him out and they brought him to Evergreen Hospital. And subsequently we learned after some tests that, that he had a brain tumor in his brain, in the right frontal lobe of his brain. And, and on Wednesday they actually removed that tumor through an eight hour surgery, um, a heart wrenching eight hours as you can imagine how that was. And, uh, and stitched them all back. And I'm, I'm happy to report today that health-wise, he's doing really well, which is a good thing. Um, he doesn't feel great, which I'm like, dude, you had brain surgery, right? Like, <laughs> I get it. That probably makes sense, you know, that you're not feeling very well. But, you know, emotionally, I think it's just not something you'd expect. He just had his 40th birthday, so he's young, amen, right? He's young. <laughs> And, uh, and just not feeling like he should have a brain tumor. And so it's been hard for him, and it's been hard for us. I know it scared many of you. We left abruptly at the end of Second Gathering. If you were here, it was a, just a rough time as a church and to kind of um, deal with that. And so I'm, I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. By the way, he actually wanted me to tell you, if you were here at First Gathering last week, during the last song, which is Jesus is Better, he um, actually messed up the words of the last part of the bridge, and he wanted you all to know that he was having a seizure at that time. <laughs> And he said, I, I, I'm not kidding, he said, if you can ha lead worship while you're having a seizure, you're welcome to try out for the worship team at any time <laughs> and join us and be a part of that. So he wanted you to know that if uh, it's just he thinks he did a pretty good job for having a minor seizure while he was actually leading the songs. And so what a scary moment for us, though. Um, just pray for him. Pray for Lindsay. Pray for his three girls. Um, we love them dearly. Tom has been a good, uh, probably one of my best friends for for about five years now, he and I just connected immediately as he came up from Salem and I got to know him here. And uh, it's been emotional. I've, I've shed a lot of tears this week and probably you have too. Um, it was really hard news and we sat there in the emergency room on Sunday and when the doctor told us the news about the mass that they found behind his, uh, behind his crane or his skull and I, I just, I felt like I was floating above what was happening. I didn't even feel like it was real at the time. And it was just kind of a strange thing and so we got a chance with the family to pray and just grieve together and and yet we know that God has a plan in the midst of all this you know let me ask you a question you don't have to answer this if you don't want to because it's super personal but if you're willing to raise your hand about this how many of you in here have had cancer have had a heart attack have had a stroke or some life-threatening injury from an accident if you're if you're interested would you raise your hand just to show us if you've had cancer if you've dealt with any of those things like that's a significant amount of us like you think about this, the pain of that, and the things that go on in the midst of the body, and we realize, like, it, life is fragile. Life is very fragile. And it's one of those things that we, that we don't get until we wake up one morning and everything changes, kind of like what happened with the Regan family this week. I know many of us have dealt with sickness and pain, and even things like death and disease, both in our own lives and in the lives of our family, or you know someone who has dealt with that as well. So I wanted to address this today from kind of a biblical perspective for us as a church to look at what it means to have a sick body, what it means to die, what it means to have a body that really is decaying, and, and, and why that is not all bad news according to scripture, and, and what the perspective that we should have really on sickness, death, and dying. Because if we don't do this, it, it comes at us like a train, and we just don't understand why me, Lord, why am I facing this disease? Why am I facing this sickness? What's the plan in this? I was healthy. I have a family. I, I have lots to do yet. And yet we know from Scripture that the Bible is not shy in talking about sickness, pain, suffering, disease, all of those things. And it actually gives us perspective on how we should live when we are faced with those. I also know that our body life here as a church, we're going to face this both now and in the future. I imagine at some point I'm going to sit with you and cry with you as you're facing the death of a loved one. I imagine you might sit with me and cry with me in the death of one of my loved ones if we're 
on God's earth long enough to be in those times with each other. And we don't want to think about those, right? We don't want to face those. We don't, we don't want to do that. But I think the Bible gives us a good perspective on how we can do it together. So I want to give you an answer kind of now. So when you have those moments in the future that you're not taken off guard, that when you have a suffering moment and you have some sort of perspective on it, a perspective that comes from the Word. And understand this. Your view of the Bible, of suffering, of sin, and God's character, and even the problem of evil will be created in the moment of an emergency unless you have it now. Does that make sense? Like, if, if you don't have a view of sin, suffering, God's character, all of those things, you will change it, you will warp it, you will create some sort of view of God in that moment if you don't do it now. So in some ways, we have to have perspective now on what God has said about sin and suffering and death and all of those things before we face those things. Because in the moment, it's too difficult. In the moment, we don't know why we're suffering, and we throw any excuse out there, and we try to figure it out through our circumstances of life. The same thing should be talked about in terms of even our emotions, because I know many of us have felt emotional this week about this, or maybe you've felt emotional about your own sickness, the own disease that you've had, whatever it is. I like to think of kind of our, our bodies kind of made up a, a body, soul, mind, and spirit kind of thing. You know, the Bible talks about that. Some people talk about whether we have kind of three parts or four parts in our body. It doesn't really matter. But I like to think of our, our spirits, our emotions, the things that should not drive us. In fact, I think of our bodies as kind of like a train, if you can picture this with me a little bit here. In fact, I kind of call us as people soul trains, right? And as part of the soul train, each car of the soul train is made up of something. And I like to think of kind of the mind and the will as being kind of the engine and the car behind it. And then the emotions are the caboose. They, they serve a purpose in the back, but really they should be driven by our mind and our will. The things that God has spoken to us, the things that's in the word. And if not, we allow our emotions to actually drive us. And if the emotions ever become the engine car of the train, it will change your theology, it will change your view of God, and ultimately you will suffer worse than you are suffering right then. I believe that. And I, and I think it's hard to even say this because Emotions are hard for us to grasp. Emotions are hard for us to actually say, okay, I I'm dealing with this here. What do I do with it? My emotions are so strong, and I actually believe this because I feel this way. But yet, what if the scriptures confront our emotions and tell us to, to think differently, to feel differently? And I think it does, in fact. Before I go any further, allow me to do one thing for you, one clarification of a huge presupposition that I need to get out of the way before we talk about 2 Corinthians 4. And that's something that you probably agree with if you're a Christian, but it's, it's hard for us to grasp as people. Like, we don't really get it until we see something that happened this week, or we see the brokenness in our nation, the racism, things like that. And it's this presupposition here, and that's this, and I say this many times around here. We live in a broken world. We live in a broken world, and we feel the effects of the brokenness each and every day because of sin. And we are not designed to live here forever. We're not designed to live here forever. Believe it or not, that's good news. The fact that we live in a broken world actually explains some of the things that we have, the ailments in our bodies, the cancers we face, the, the friend of ours who collapses on stage. And we realize, oh, we live in a broken world. Things are broken. We're not designed to be here forever. God had a plan even in that. Many of us don't want this to be true, or we even live like it's not in some way, shape, or form. But with all the brokenness around us in the world today, I don't know else, what else we would say about the world unless we believe that. Unless we believe that literally thousands of years ago, the first sin came in the world through the choices of man and woman who made some horrible choice to not follow God. And ever since then, everything has been broken. Even in Genesis 3, the Bible tells us that God actually even cursed the ground at that point. He didn't curse humanity, which is beautiful if you think about that. The ones who actually sinned and made the mistakes, he cursed the ground. It shouldn't surprise us even to some level when we see things like earthquakes and tsunamis. It should grieve us, and, and we should feel the emotions of those things, but, but we shouldn't go, why did that happen? Because the answer is that, that we live in a broken world. Things are broke. The good news is that it's not going to remain broken forever. Our bodies won't remain broken forever. In fact, there's something that we have to look forward to, a perspective, an eternal perspective, might I even say, that we have if we are followers of Jesus. The truth is, the moment we're born, we start to waste away. 
I was reminded of this when my daughter Bethany was born about 12 years ago almost now. She's a sweetie. Um, she's becoming a pre-teenager now, so she's learning to be uh, assertive about very things on her own. I'm just saying this really gently. It's, uh, it's the way it is in our life right now. But I remember when she was born and I, I got the first chance to hold her. I'd never even changed a diaper before. I was the youngest in my family and I got to do some of these things. But I remember thinking to myself, she's so unadulterated. She's so new. She's fresh. She hasn't been broken by anything yet. There's, there's nothing that has stained her. Like me, I'm messed up. I got no hope, right? I, I got years and years of, of just brokenness in the world, and I've broken bones. I've, I've had broken relationships. I watched my parents go through a broken marriage, all of those things. And yet here's my daughter, who seems perfect, who seems like she's not broken. But the reality is she was actually born broken too. She was born with a sinful nature, and she was born the moment she was born, her body started wasting away which is hard for me to even understand. It's hard for me to even grasp. But it's Christian theology. It really is. It's a reminder that our bodies are wasting away as a result of sin. So I know people sometimes feel the weight of brokenness and the acuteness of that every single day, but there is good news and the Bible does not shy away from talking about that. So with that presupposition, I want to read to you Paul's idea of what happens in our brokenness, how we respond to our brokenness, our sin, our, our, our sufferings, our sicknesses. What do we do in those cases? And this is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. I'll read this to you, and if you don't have your Bible, that's okay. You can kind of follow along with the words I'm saying. Unfortunately, we can't put them on the screens today. So. Paul writes these words, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death, for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So, we do not lose heart. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Beautiful passage here. I almost picture Paul writing this with wrinkled hands, arthritis, the pain of his own life that he'd experienced. The Bible talks about some sort of affliction, a thorn in the flesh that Paul had all his life and he didn't know what to do with it. He pleaded with the Lord many times to take it away from him. Many scholars think it was his eyesight that he couldn't see well. And so I, I almost picture him writing this with the wrinkled hands of the arthritis, not being able to see what he's even writing. And he's writing these words that I don't lose heart, though my outer nature, the body that I have is absolutely wasting away right now. My inner nature is being renewed day by day. The entire point, I know we're not in 2 Corinthians right now, but the entire point of 2 Corinthians is to bring comfort to Christians in the midst of suffering and to live for Jesus according to the gospel and what the calling the gospel has in their life in the midst of suffering times. And not just suffering through persecution, but suffering through sickness and brokenness in their own bodies. The outward nature that's wasting away because their inner nature is being renewed day by day by day. I love how the context of this whole thing in 2 Corinthians 1 through 4, Paul has actually just laid out several gifts of God that he has given to the church in Corinthians, including things like the Holy Spirit, forgiveness through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word of God, hope and forgiveness of people for one another through the new covenant that God has created and given 
to people and the glory of being transformed in the image of Jesus one day. Those are the gifts that Paul talks about he gives. And then it's really interesting because right here in chapter 4, verse 17, he starts talking about another gift. And that new gift is this idea of our outer nature wasting away, of being broken, but our inner nature being renewed day by day. See, even though we live in a broken world, and even though our bodies are decaying and dying, even right now as we sit here, we have hope for something, and that's an inward transformation, a renewal of heart that doesn't change what's happening on the outside. It gives us perspective for what's happening on the outside. See, that's the thing. Paul understands that there's going to be brokenness in the world. And he says that how, how come all these good things happen to a Christian without the bad things, in a sense? You get all of these great things, the blessings of the gospel, forgiveness, life together, the, the hope of the new covenant, and you also get renewing of your body, renewing of our minds as well. Now, I'm sure this is kind of challenging because if you hear me, what I'm saying is I'm kind of saying that, that suffering might be a little bit of a gift in that way. That suffering could be used as a gift, that it could be used as something that that God is working on us to, even though our outward nature really is wasting, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. And if God really gives that to us as a gift, that's hard news. That's tough for me to even say today because it's actually emotional for me right now. Like, I see my friends sitting in the hospital right now, and I go, what? What? God, if I were you, that's not the way I would do that. <laughs> I would choose something else. I mean, the guy is so gifted. He's so talented. He's such a better musician than I am. He's a better preacher than I am, I think, many times. Because, And he says I'm a better preacher than he is. I mean, that's just the way it works out. Because we work with each other. And I go, really? God, do you really want to do things this way? And yet here I see that this is the design that God had in mind. This may not be too far from your own experience in life. In fact, even as I'm preaching this, you may say, yeah, I understand that. I don't just understand that. I literally feel it in my body right now. Like, I, I literally am breaking as we're sitting here. It's hard for me to sit down. I have back problems. Like, I, I have to stand during your sermon because you preach for like 35 minutes, so I can't sit for that long. And you, and you feel it. You just, you get it at some level more than even just saying it right now. Our outer nature wasting away in verse 16. It's a very strong word in the Greek text, in fact, that idea of wasting away. It literally says in some of your Bibles, if you have an older Bible, it says being destroyed. Our outer body is being destroyed. It's the same term where moths eat cloth. That's the idea behind it here. Paul says our, our body is just like that. That's what's happening to them. And for some context, let me just say this. No one understands this more than the Apostle Paul does. No one understands brokenness in their bodies more than the Apostle Paul. If you, if you do have your Bibles, I want to flip forward to, to chapter 11 real quick here and in 2 Corinthians, I'm going to read a few words to you so you kind of get what he has gone through. Because Paul actually explains what he's experienced in his own life in terms of suffering as a way to encourage those. In verse 23 in chapter 11, Paul says, Are they servants of Christ? I, I am a better one. I'm actually talking like a madman here with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often I've been near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship through many a sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure of me on the anxiety for all the churches. And they didn't even have a Xanax back then. Who is weak and, and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. See, Paul gets it. He understands what it's like to have a broken body. External suffering through other people's hands and internal suffering through sickness, hunger, and, and various things that he talks about. See, Paul's not speaking in a vacuum here. He's not just telling us to suck it up because you'll be okay. He's telling us, I get it, but there's something about suffering that, is, that you need to understand. There's something about it that, that you need to boast in the weakness that God has given to each one of you. 
Why do good people hurt? Why do good people die? Why does evil seem to triumph over good? What do suffering and sickness do in the midst of a person's life? I would contend to you today that it actually has a purpose in your life, and it's not just at random. I would contend that if you're facing some sort of sickness, and, and even the sickness that, that our friend Tom had last Sunday and surgery this week, it's not random. It's nothing that God didn't have control over at some point, but God actually wants to use it. Do you know, I sat in the, I sat in the room with Tom right before he went to surgery, and he looked at me and he said, you know, I, I think God has a purpose for what happened with me. He goes, I even think that God had a plan that I would, I would fall in front of our church. Like, it's embarrassing. Like, I don't know if I want to go through that again. But I think that God had a plan in the midst of all of that. And he said, I don't know what that is yet, but I believe it to be true. Do you know this week I went over to Banner Bank to set up an account to help pay for some of the expenses for Tom as Tom's friend. And I went up and set up kind of an a account that people can donate money to and give to as a way just to help with their massive medical expenses. If you, ever, if you want to donate to that, you're welcome to see me afterwards. This is not part of Imprint Church. This is, I'm his friend. I'm doing this as his friend as well. And you can donate to that at any time. And I would be happy to explain how you do that. But I went over there. It was really interesting. I explained what happened to, to the people at Banner Bank. And it's really cool. Our, our admin lead, Jenny Bossio here, has made a great relationship with the people in the bank over there as she goes in, as you've been giving. It's so generous to Imprint Church and all the stuff you've been giving. And she's able to go over there every week and build relationships. And, and so she said, oh, the pastor of the church is going to come down and talk to you in a minute here about setting up an account. This is what happened. And I wandered in there. It was a really interesting time because they set me up with one of the, the, the gals, the account managers there. And I sat down with her, and she asked me all the questions about what was happening. And she looks at me and she goes, why do, you, why do you think God allows that kind of stuff to happen? And I said, I have an answer for that. Let me tell you about that a little bit. And I gave her a, a quick five-minute spiel about the brokenness in our world and how the gospel actually, actually heals that and how we as Christians have hope one day, even though our bodies are decaying, that we will one day be raised with glory with Jesus Christ. And she looks at me, I, I, I'm not kidding, as, as truth as I can tell you, she looks at me and she goes, I think I need to find a church this weekend. She goes, I haven't been to church since I was a little girl. I need to figure it out. I was like, that is amazing. She told me she lives up in Everett. I was going to invite her to imprint. She said, I want to find something close. I'm like, that is beautiful. It would be a great thing. And so I got a chance to go in there the next day because we had some donations do dropped off to me. And so I wandered in the next day, so I get a chance to say hi to her today, again that day. And I dropped off the donations, and she looks at me. She goes, you know, I read my Bible last night for the first time in a while. I was like, did you really? What did you read? She goes, I read the Psalms. They're beautiful, and they were super meaningful for my life. I'm like, that's great. You should find a church. And then I said, you could go to Imprint Church if you want to, because I'm shameless. I just plugged it. It's the way it goes. <laughs> but here in the midst of suffering, in the midst of a broken thing that happened to Tom, God is somehow getting the glory out of it. Even though the inner nature, the outer nature of Tom is wasting away day by day, just like you, just like me, God is using that for something. See, I, I think Paul is telling us right here in 2 Corinthians 4 that suffering is actually our chance to show the power and glory of God in your life. That's the, that's the tough part. Suffering is your chance to show the power and glory of God. We see that both in verse 7 and verse 15. Paul almost boasts in the suffering we just read about here because he understands that God will be glorified in his weakness more than he would be glorified in Paul's strengths. He knows the tribulation that he faces are the perfect moment to say the words that Tom was singing right before he collapsed, that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than all of these things I'm facing. Jesus is better than the suffering that I'm encountering right now. Doesn't that make sense? The more competent we are, the more people miss that it's actually God who should get the glory. In fact, it's not even an accident the stupid power went out this morning. Because here it is. Like, we don't have a show to offer you at Imprint Church. We're a, a church gathered, a people. The church is you and me together. And we are here raising our voices, wondering what to do with the brokenness of our world, and being aligned every Sunday as we gather together and what Jesus would say to us. So we go out and have an answer for this. And, and not lose heart, as the Bible says for each one of us. That we know even though our outer nature is broken and dying and things like that, we get a chance to use our suffering to show the glory and goodness of God to every person that is out there. Now, it's not always the case. I understand that many times people are afflicted and, and they wallow in the world of why this would happen to me. Why did this happen to me? Why would I be dealing with this? And, 
And as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that people tend to do when they face some sort of extreme suffering or pain is that they ask the question, why me, Lord? Why would this element, ailment come upon me and why would I face this? I've done everything I could to serve you and I've been working hard for your glory and yet here I am. But here's the thing. Maybe God would actually want to use that in your life to bring him glory. Maybe God would actually like to use the pain and suffering just like Paul did to boast in your weakness and, and for you to say to people around you, actually, I am broken. My body's broken. The Bible talks about that. But Jesus is enough for me. He's enough for me, and he's enough to sustain me, and ultimately he wants to get the glory. I love what Kent Hughes in his commentary about 2 Corinthians 4 says about the words that Paul says. He says, it wasn't as if Paul reached down into his soul, just sucked it up, and became a man. It was actually never his strength. It was actually God's. Paul's weakness and the occasion, was the occasion for God's power. Paul remained a cracked pot, at his crumbling flesh allowed the power and glory of God to shine so brightly. See, when we do have that jar of clay moment where we realize we're broken, we have a chance to actually respond to Jesus even in that. And I know that's, that's weighty news for several of us in here. And I don't, I don't say this just on the stage as, as barking out at you. I say this with compassion. I say this with a lot of you know personal hurt this week as well, and, and knowing that this is not something we should take lightly. I think that's why Paul calls it here an eternal weight of glory. It's a weight that you have suffering for God's glory. It's a pretty intense idea. I love how Job says in Job 121, after everything's breaking down for him, he says, naked I come from my mother's womb and naked I'm gonna return. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I love how Nehemiah says in chapter 6, when all seems lost, that he says, this is from the Lord as well. And his words are, now, Lord, please strengthen my hands. And we see this throughout the text that we read today. Verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, in jars of clay, and the surpassing greatness of the power may be from God and not from ourselves. In verse 10, we're always carrying about us the body of the dying Jesus, that's another idea of the decaying outer man that we have, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested or shown in our bodies so that the life of God's Son is exalted and shown through our day-to-day -day living and how we deal with suffering and pain and sickness in that. And in verse 11, Paul says, For I'm constantly being delivered over to death. I'm constantly being delivered over to death so that for Jesus' sake, he might be manifest in my mortal flesh. So God has de de declared glorious even in his decaying body, which is a beautiful thing. It's maybe tough to understand, but I hope you understand it. I hope it gives you perspective of why you actually do suffer some time. You can use that to either feel the pain of it on a regular basis. I'm not telling you not to hurt over that and not to grieve over those things, but I am telling you there may be a purpose behind that as well. The second thing I think we see in this is that we need to recognize the death is at work in each of us every single day. I've been emphasizing through this time, but in verse 12, it just says it. It's as clear as can be that Paul says, death as working in you. It's not some sort of mystical death that Paul is talking about here. It's literal, actual death. If you just understand that, the death is working in your body every single day, it will change your perspective on how you live. I've heard so many people tell me stories about having kind of a near-death experience, and it changes the way they live. Do you know Paul says you're having a near-death experience like every day? You're, and it should change the way you live every day because death is actually at work in your body. I love how Paul says in Colossians 3, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is settled, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are earth. For you died, is what he says. And now your life is hidden with Christ in God. See, his theology of life and death is actually informing his life instead of the other way around. He didn't wait till death and suffering and pain came before he understood who God was and what God was going to use these things in his life for. He actually believed there's a purpose for all these things so that when I face them, I have perspective. And that's the encouragement. I guess the, one of the big ideas for you today is to walk away with that. That you realize, oh yeah, God could use my pain and suffering. God could use the sickness in our body. We're going to face this as a church. 
as we go down the road, that the people here are going to experience pain and brokenness. And we have a chance as a church, as individuals, to show the glory and goodness of God because death really is at work in our bodies. There's a man named Charles West, who's a pastor, who wrote these words, We turn to God for help when our foundations are shaking, only to learn that it's actually often God who is shaking them for us. See, the thing is, if we understand that and we have that perspective, it helps us not to be swayed by the emotional moment. It helps us not to lose heart in the midst of that, that this eternal weight that we have that faces each one of us, this death and dying that is working in us, that we use for God's good and not just for our sorrow. The third thing I want to say today is, as I'm bringing this to a close here, the solution of all of this, even though we know that God can use these things for our glory and his good, and that we are, do have a decaying body in some way, I love what Paul says here. There's a solution. The solution is this. Let our inner nature be renewed day by day. We don't lose heart by allowing our inner nature to be renewed every single day. In other words, in some way, you almost have to preach this message to yourself every day. Before you face that moment, before that broken thing happens, before whatever it is, fill in the blank, and maybe it's already happened for you. I, I feel that weight of some of you who have experienced those things. And you could probably actually stand up here and preach a sermon to us on how God has used these things in your life and how your inner nature need to be renewed day by day. But Paul says, allow your inner nature to be renewed day by day so that you don't lose heart when these things happen. There's a couple reasons he says this. The, the one is just a beautiful picture of what one day we have to look forward to as people. That he says, one day we will be raised like Jesus from the dead. And so this is a slight momentary affliction that is paving a way for a weight of glory, for something beautiful for us to have that one day we'll be risen again with Christ. See, this is, this is Christian belief, that we have a chance to, to not just live this life and that's the end, but we have a chance to understand that this life will be broken, but one day it's paving a way to something glorious, that one day we will be raised like Jesus unto new life, given renewed bodies, renewed souls, renewed hearts, so that we can go forward and not have sickness, not have pain anymore, not have death or suffering in that moment. See, we focus our eyes and attention on that idea that, oh yeah, God, I understand things are broken now, but there's an eternal thing that's going to happen. That you're going to raise me up to give me a new body that doesn't deal with the brokenness, that doesn't deal with the, the pain that I face every single day. And I'm not saying today that our tribulations and pains are not real or that Paul is even trying to minimize our pain. He's just noting that in light of eternity, it's momentary. In light of what we're experiencing forever, we get a chance to have something so much better. There's hope in us after our actual bodies do die. The hope is being raised again unto new life like Jesus Christ. See, the, the hope that you can have if you're facing that kind of tribulation, trial, and pain today is to put your faith in Jesus Christ. To say to him this morning, I, I get it. I've faced life like this for a long time, and I, I need newness of life. And and I put my faith in you. I trust you, Jesus, this morning to, to come true with what this is saying. That, that even though I'm facing these things, the Bible talks about them clearly. And, and I put my faith in you because one day we'll all be made right. That one day none of us in here will deal with death, sickness, or disease if we trust in Jesus Christ today. So there's hope in life after death. But even before that, really practically, God promises to actually be with us today as well. That's the cool thing of this passage. In verse 8 and 9, Paul says, We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not despairing. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We always carry around with us the body of Jesus Christ and the promise of his death and resurrection so we don't lose heart. Even Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Jesus says, Surely I am with you always into the very end of the age. See, we don't face sufferings alone. We have hope for eternal being with Jesus forever and ever. But right now, we don't face this alone either because God has promised to be with us. I said to Tom this week as we were talking about, isn't it amazing the Holy Spirit would not be called a comforter unless he needed to comfort us at some point in our pain and in our suffering? And isn't that true? We need to experience that God is with us right now. And in this, we have hope. 
In this, we have hope for Jesus walking with us through the pain and brokenness of our world. I heard Rick Warren once say these words, Optimism is different than hope. Optimism simply says it's not so bad. But hope actually admits, yes, it's bad, it's really bad, but I still believe and I still trust in God. See, that's what we have as Christians. We have that hope that one day we resurrected in a new life, new bodies, no sickness, no sorrow, no suffering with Jesus. But right now he's with us and we have hope in that, that he'll walk through us in those things. In closing today, we need to recognize that this text is simply one huge invitation to remember that we need to have a good perspective in the troubles that we'll face in this life. Jesus said in this life you will have troubles, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We will face the inevitable pain of life, some of us more than others, and our perspective is to be renewed more and more day by day in our faith in Jesus Christ. We get a chance to respond to this today. It's my hope that this was meaningful to you. I, I changed my sermon. I, I planned my Mark sermon on Monday, and then I was like, what am I doing? This isn't right. Our church needs to grasp this and understand this together. And, and it's just one of those things that I think that we needed to feel together as a community. And I know there's many of you who face pain and sickness and suffering in here. And I hope this gave you some sort of perspective on that, to understand that Jesus hasn't left you alone in this, that it's not random, that there may be something that God wants to use in this for you to show his goodness and the glory of God to that. But know also that he's with you, that he wants to come for you in the midst of that. And as we turn to sing some songs here in a second, we're going to sing some songs. And, and you can sing with us and praise Jesus that one day he will renew your body. That even though right now you're outwardly wasting away, you can inwardly renew yourself by singing even these songs. You can pray with us during these songs that we get a chance just to sing and pray together. You can come forward anytime and receive communion on both the tables up here. I lit up one over here now. You can come and grab a piece of bread and dip that in the cup and receive that and thank Jesus for his broken body for you on your behalf. You can also, at any moment today, just put your trust in Jesus. Trust him for what he's done. To understand that pain in this world and suffering is not part of his plan originally, but it's true in our world now, and that we can turn to him and hope that one day he will fix everything as well. That's a picture of the gospel today that we can grasp a hold of and walk away with. At any point during our gathering, you're also welcome to come and put your gifts and offerings in the baskets up there. If you're a visitor this morning, you can drop your response card in there, your guest card in there with your name and information on there. But I want to encourage you this morning to to allow the Lord to touch your heart. May the Lord, I wrote a little benediction for us today. May the Lord who raises up the humble and strengthens the weak and refreshes the weary stretch forth his hand from heaven to you today. May he, may he help us fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, we are responding to you even if it's difficult. Lord, we are responding to you even when we don't feel like we can. Lord, I, I pray that you would help us to understand that, that you have a purpose for us in all things. God, it's no accident that we're at where we're at today and that you care for us, you love us, and you want us to live for you. You want us to experience your goodness and you want us to show your glory through whatever we're facing, Lord. I would pray, God, for my brothers and sisters in here who are facing suffering and sickness right now. And Lord, I pray that you would comfort them. I pray that you would show them the, the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Lord, they might experience your presence with us today. May you help us understand that you haven't left us, that you're with us forever and always, God, even in the midst of suffering and sickness and pain. Lord, we trust you today. We put our faith in you. Jesus, we worship you. We pray all these things in your great name. Amen.